All right. Hey, everybody. This is Kent C. Dodds, your friend. And um, I am joined by two friends, actually. We have Lynn Clark and Till. I actually didn't ask your last name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what is your last name, Till? It's Schneiderbreit. Oh, well, I'm glad that I didn't try to pronounce that anyway. <laughs> um, Lynn was actually on uh, one of my podcasts in the past, JavaScript Air, and uh, and she knows that I am notorious for mispronouncing people's names. So, <laughs> so um, cool. Well, thank you um, for joining us, both of you. Um, I'm really excited to chat about WebAssembly and this new exciting thing, uh, WASI. Is that how you pronounce that? Yes. Yeah. WASI. Yeah. We WebAssembly uh, system interface, right? Correct. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to chat about that and get some ideas there. But I want to get to know you, uh, each of you, first a little bit, uh, especially if our listeners haven't heard of you um, yet. So, Till, why don't we have you go first? Can you introduce yourself to us? Uh, sure. So, um... I work at Mozilla, where I'm the manager of the developer technologies team, which uh, so my team is working on Rust, the language and the compiler, and uh, WebAssembly tooling. So not the WebAssembly execution environment in Firefox, but the tools for um, compiling to WebAssembly, for example, and um, also WebAssembly runtimes outside the browser and this WASI uh, initiative that we just announced last week is um, our part of that is developed in my team. Very cool. Yeah, we're definitely looking forward to hearing more about uh, WebAssembly outside the browser because it's like, wait, what? <laughs> so <laughs> it's going to be great. I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting about that. Lynn, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. I yeah. also, <laughs> thank you. I also work at Mozilla. Um, we actually work in the same team, advanced development. And so I work closely with the WebAssembly folks and the Rust folks, uh, and basically have been focusing on WebAssembly for about the last two years since it's been on by default in browsers. Thank you for that. Um, you failed to mention one really important fact about yourself, and that is your unique skills at karaoke and getting everybody to join you. <laughs> <laughs> that is on my resume. I'm glad that you reminded me to point that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, Code Cartoons is fantastic. Um, it's such a great way to teach people uh, new concepts. Uh, I, I love that um, as you've made this transition more to uh, systems uh, type stuff that you've carried that with you because it helps people like me who um, I really don't know much about that uh, to really um, at least understand at a high level what these things are doing. So um, thank you for all of that. Um, so great. Let's talk about WebAssembly a little bit. Um, so I think it would be really useful for people to get kind of a history of what WebAssembly even is and especially the why behind WebAssembly. Like why does uh, why does this matter um, it is typically really helpful for people to understand what this thing really is and, and how it works and what role it plays in their lives. Can one of you give us a kind of a brief history of WebAssembly? Sure. So the idea behind WebAssembly uh, came about, the, it came from ASM.js. And um, the idea behind ASM.js was that you could compile languages like C and C++ to run on the web and not only do it in a way that it made it possible to run those languages, but also made it possible uh, for those languages to run efficiently on the web. And um, so WebAssembly was a way of taking that idea even further, because there's only so much you can do when you're compiling uh, a language to JavaScript. So mm. um, WebAssembly took that further and uh, became a compile target that was separate from any other language that a bunch of different languages could compile to. And it could run even more efficiently than ASM.js on the web. Hmm, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so why why do I, as a JavaScript full time JavaScript engineer, that's like the only language that I really can say that I know. Um, why why would I care about this? Um, is this like something um, that I would use in my day to day? Um, do I run into the problems that WebAssembly solves regularly? Um, in what scenario does WebAssembly make sense for me as a, a front-end web developer? I think there are a whole variety of different 
uh, instances, uh, different cases where you could uh, benefit from WebAssembly. So one example that um, one of our engineers at Mozilla figured out how to rewrite the source maps parser. So the source maps library, it's used in Webpack, it's used in our dev developer tools. Um, it has a parser that was rewritten uh, in Rust compiled to WebAssembly. And that parser is now, I think, 11 times faster after rewriting it. Um, the mm. WordPress project rewrote their parser that runs in their online editor uh, in WebAssembly. And I think that's 86 times faster on average. So um, in these wow. cases where you have things where you, you know, um, the code gets called a lot. And it's not, you know, maybe as fast as it could be. You're getting some uh, problems with the execution speed. A lot of times that makes sense to write to WebAssembly. There are a whole bunch of other cases too, but that's the one that I think uh, most web developers uh, are interested in and acquainted with. Mm, yeah. So like solving performance problems yeah. um, in our, our web application. There is one other case though, until you might be able to speak to this. Um, yeah. So um I think the, the performance use case is the one that is most important for front-end developers, where really in, in a lot of cases you have specific performance hotspots where your application overall really suffers from this one part of your code being slow. And um, it used to be that you had to jump through like hoops and really um, to perform all kinds of work acts to get your JavaScript to be fast enough. And with WebAssembly, we um, see in a lot of cases that instead using a language like C++ or Rust and using just writing just straightforward normal code in those languages makes um, the performance hotspot just go away. And so mm. one really interesting use case is to just take um, a piece of your overall application and replace the JavaScript implementing that piece with uh, Rust code, for example, and otherwise leave your application unchanged. But the other big use case is porting existing code to the web, be it individual modules where maybe functionality that you want to use in your web application exists as C++ or Rust or Go code, and you want to make use of it instead of having to rewrite it in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Or um, you want to have a whole application running on the web. And as an extreme example, uh, Autodesk took their AutoCAD application that they developed over the last, I don't actually know, 30 plus years and compiled it to WebAssembly, and now it works on the web. That's like bonkers to me. I actually a uh, question about that that I've been wondering for a long time. Um, what's the the story of WebAssembly and its interaction with the DOM? Um, it, when a scenario like that, where we're uh, taking an entire application and compiling it to work with the web, um, I imagine that the the tools that that application used natively before uh, don't really uh, work quite as well on the web. Like, like we have a different um, API for the UI side of things. So what's the um, what's that story like with WebAssembly? There are different answers to that. Um, but I think the most that the best way to view this is to say, you want to have a native user interface for each platform that your application is running on. You want to have a native macOS interface if you have a Mac part and a Windows interface if you have a Windows part. Same for Android and iOS. That's normal. And that, that's often um, most commonly what people do. They have a shared part of their application that works on all these platforms and um, then a native user interface for each of these. And now with WebAssembly, we can add the web to these other platforms, but that doesn't mean that you don't still need a native UI for the web. And a native mm. UI for the web means one written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Mm. And so you wouldn't... Um, people are trying to make it possible to just use 
some other framework um, behind the scenes and automatically generate anything without even having to worry about the web. Hmm. We don't really believe that that is the right approach. That will not lead to good usability. It'll lo- uh, lead to really bad accessibility normally. Mm-hmm. And um, in general, it, it'll feel alien to the web. And so mm-hmm. you, you should treat the web the way you treat these other platforms and give it a first class web native user interface. Great. I, I'm actually thrilled to hear that as a, from a job security standpoint <laughs> um, as a front end developer, but um, also like it, it makes a lot of sense to me that, uh, that that would be the case that the web just turns into um, another um, user interface specific implementation detail of, of your application. Um, but the interesting idea of being able to take all of the core logic, the business logic of your application and share that across all of these platforms is very interesting and appealing to me, um, uh, which, I, yeah, I think that's that's pretty, uh, pretty cool. Now, one, one question that I had about the performance aspect, and I, I think a lot of people are kind of interested about this as well, is um, once once you add an abstraction like uh, WebAssembly into an application, um, before I, I had this you know this complex code that existed in this function, uh, and I just call that, um, and it's all exists in the same you know memory space and all of that stuff. And and now I'm taking that same function and that functionality and putting it into WebAssembly, and I have to have some sort of communication between JavaScript and WebAssembly, which is going to add some overhead. Um, and so it, are there situations where um, um, you have to make sure that the, the code you're um, porting is like very performance intensive to make up for the difference in performance overhead? Or am I overstating that uh, performance issue? Well, the performance issue has been changing over time and is continuing to change. So um, originally there were two performance issues. The actual call between JavaScript between uh, JavaScript and WebAssembly and WebAssembly back to JavaScript, those calls actually uh, took a lot of time in and of themselves um, mm. because engines hadn't optimized them yet. Right. Um, and then there's also the exchanging data. So you know, um, even without the cost of the call, just uh, sending data from one to the other because you have to. Re- uh, take the object that's in JavaScript and write it out into what's called linear memory. So basically, um, turn it into numbers and then put it in in this part of memory that WebAssembly has access to. Um, so those were the two uh, costs: the actual call and then the data marshaling. The actual call, we've been able to optimize that in Firefox. We actually now have those calls um, in some cases working uh, even better; they're even faster than JavaScript to JavaScript calls if they're not in line. What? Yeah. That, 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 that makes me think maybe we could optimize the JavaScript to JavaScript a little bit. <laughs> well, there's some nice, amazing. there's some properties of WebAssembly that actually make it easy to optimize. Um, mm. And and so, um, so we have in some ways solved that problem. Uh, there's still a well, little bit of tweaking that can happen to make it even faster, but um, that's no longer... Uh, really holding people back from um, from doing the a lot of calls between JavaScript and WebAssembly. The one thing that is still remaining, though, is that data marshaling cost. And I think that Till can probably speak uh, to that because he's working on some of the standardization that will help with that. Um, yeah, so one of the biggest issues there is uh, to get strings um, from WebAssembly to JavaScript and the other way around. Because... In JavaScript engines, strings are some under the hood, not not what you interact with as a JavaScript developer, but what engine implementers have to do. Uh, strings are some of the most complicated and um, uh, most h- highest optimized data structures that you could possibly imagine, because um, you think of a string as just this this um, array of characters that's not even close to how engines internally uh, represent most strings so if you take Mm. a substring then that is for example represented as um, a pointer into the original string and um, and and a length 
And if you then mm. uh, combine that with another another substring by using the plus operator, then that is represented as there are these two things that we now join as a, into one string, but really we still keep these two pointers into different strings. So all of wow. this representation, you as a developer normally don't have to care about, but engine implementers have to. And that mm -hmm. means you can't just... Um, straightforward uh, uh, say here have the string on the WebAssembly side because the language running in, in WebAssembly C, C++ or Rust they have their own representation of strings so you, you have mm. to encode and decode between these um, and there's some fundamental overhead to that but we are no, 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 not really close to having fully optimized even what what we can do in the engine side. And in fact, just last week, I talked to someone at Google. Um, so I was at the TC39 meeting, and mm -hmm. um, we talked about one aspect of this that showed up in uh, profiling some code that did a lot of this string translation. And... Um, agreed on a change to the um, HTML standard for DOM built-ins that will take some of that overhead back uh, away. And hmm. um, engines can do quite a bit of optimizations. But none of this changes that you are, that there is some fundamental overhead and you are in the end right that it's, it's always a trade-off. Do I is it worth it to cross this boundary to do the computation in a language where it's faster or do you get more overhead by doing that right yeah and it's not just uh, the performance question either um, but also the um like the tooling around that and all, all of that stuff so yeah i, I think and now um, analyzing the actual costs um is you know that's kind of a programming thing. We're always uh, in, uh, cost benefit analysis on everything that we do. Hopefully, hopefully we're doing that and not just yeah. following the next shiny object. But <laughs> and, and there are some um, use cases where it's just very obviously the case that um, mm. either it'll the, the performance won't matter because the the data you're um, operating on is so small that whether you have this translation cost or not or the computation cost, it really doesn't matter, or if it becomes relevant, then doing it in WebAssembly is obviously the right choice. So, mm -hmm. and in those use cases, like the parser Slin mentioned earlier, um, going with the WebAssembly route just takes the headache away of worrying about it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, there, WebAssembly, um, as we've recently been um, hearing about, it's not just limited to the web. Um, but it's actually, um, you know, we can take WebAssembly out of the browser, um, which makes WebAssembly kind of seem like a misnomer of a name uh, <laughs> now at this point. But, um, you know, this is how the web eats the world, is the technology in the web just, it's everywhere now. Um, you can run Node on, you know, anywhere now. Um, exactly. So, uh, so let's talk about WebAssembly outside of the web. Um, let, first, a little bit about the why would you care to do this? Um, and um, and then I've got a couple other questions um, to understand its its place in the web. Can we talk a little bit about what this WASI thing is all about? Sure. Um, WASI is the WebAssembly System Interface. It's an effort um, that we are uh, leading to standardize a system interface um, for WebAssembly. And I want to explain a little bit about what a system interface is. Um, you know. When you are running code on a machine, you don't want to have let applications just rewrite files willy nilly and just access memory. And so um, the operating system sits in between. And uh, when your application wants to do something, it has to ask the operating system instead of just doing it itself. And so the way that the operating system uh, um, you know makes these service of services available that. Uh, the functions that it gives your application in order to be able to do these things, that's the system interface. Uh, but WebAssembly, so when you're compiling your code, you'll say what kind of machine you're targeting, so what operating system you're targeting, um, so that your code knows which of these 
implementations of the system interface to use based on um, you know what platform you're targeting. Yeah, like this, we're talking about the the chips that the you know the hardware is using and, and things like that. More like the operate. So like actually um, saying that you're targeting a Mac or you're targeting mm. a Linux machine. Um, and so the problem here for WebAssembly is that when you're compiling your code, you don't yet know what operating system you want to run on. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's this portability thing that we have with WebAssembly. We want this WebAssembly file to be run across all different kinds of operating systems. So we need to not just target a single system interface. We need um, a conceptual system interface. Something um, just as WebAssembly is an assembly for a conceptual machine, you know, it can run across all these different, uh, you know, chips that you were talking about, all of these different um, machine architectures, because it's this conceptual assembly that sits mm -hmm. on top. We need a conceptual operating system and we need a system interface to target that conceptual operating system. And so that's what WASI is. Um, and one of the nice things about it is that because we're developing it now instead of 40 years ago when a lot of the other system interfaces started being developed, um, we can bring some uh, of the most up-to-date uh, concepts from systems into the design of the system interface. So it actually takes mm -hmm. a new uh, approach to security which has been studied in academia for the past four years, but only has recently gained any kind of traction in industry. We can bring that to the system interface so that we can have really fine grained uh, sandboxing and security controls. Oh, very good. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and so um, this uh, WASI um, kind of, or these implementations, are these basically like um, a virtual machine, like the uh, JVM and that kind of thing? Is that kind of what it's basically like? Yeah, so um, runtimes can use WASI, and and then uh, we can have a lot of the same properties of the JVM. I think Till probably can speak to that. Yeah, so th there clearly are some some commonalities with something like the JV JVM or Microsoft.NET Common Language Runtime, mm. um, or also scripting languages like. Python or Ruby, which also bring this virtualized environment with them. But what these all have in common is that they're, let's say, highly opinionated. They, they are optimized for a specific language or a specific set of languages in the case of the JVM mm. or the CLR, um, and have fairly high level memory models, for example, and the bytecode is just for, in the JVM case, for example, highly optimized for Java. And um, with WebAssembly, we have something that's much more, much closer to other, um, to, to actual CPU architectures, and thus allows you to target this runtime using a wide range of different languages and also allows it to scale to um, use cases from tiny embedded sensors up to large server farms with um, the same kinds of abstractions. Perhaps when using a different runtime because different runtimes can be optimized for these different use cases, but mm. you can target them with the same tool chains. And with the tool chains you're used to um, because you're using them for other things. For example, as of today, using a nightly compiler, you can use, target WASI um, with Rust without anything special at all, just by say, telling the compiler, compile this to WASI instead of as a macOS binary. And um, so our, our big goal is to enable people to target this environment with the tools they are already using and still cover this wide array of use cases. And so open, really opening up new worlds for people without them having to learn a whole new language or a whole new runtime system. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting. So as a primarily front end engineer, I do plenty of node um, as well, but um, it's, um, it's, it seems like this is 
the WASI side of things is more targeted to um, people writing native code that's going to run on on servers or on IoT devices. Um, and the the idea is, I want to be able to um, have choose my language of choice and then have um, the one um, you know the build artifact um, be able to run on any platform. Is that kind of the the goal of WASI then? Well, you know, I think that WASI can actually help a bunch of different use cases. Uh, it can help a bunch of different runtimes. You will have runtimes that are meant for those kinds of people who um, aren't really involved in the Node ecosystem at all. But we're also talking to the folks in the Node project about how they can use WASI. So um, I don't know if you've ever had to do native module development. I'm sure you've had to use a native module at the very least. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So with native modules, um, they the reason why uh, you have to compile, you know, when you have like no JIP running when you're installing an application with a native module. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, it's, it's it, like half the time it doesn't work and you're like, oh, no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and if they, if you, the developer doesn't have you run node JIP, then they have to compile a whole bunch of different binaries that you then download this whole binary over the wire. Um, that is just really inconvenient for users. And mm -hmm. it also um, is inconvenient for people like NPM who end up getting all of the uh, issues filed against their, their issue tracker when no JIP doesn't work, even though they're not involved at all, <laughs> um, and have to actually deliver these different binaries and, and store them. So um, this having this uh, these native modules that aren't portable uh, actually causes problems for the ecosystem. And mm -hmm. if we were going to run those native modules in something like WebAssembly instead, you could solve that portability problem. Just as you uh, can run your JavaScript modules across any runtime that's using Node, you'd be able to run your WebAssembly modules against any runtime using Node. And so um, the Node folks are really excited about this. And I do think that there's uh, very likely a future where node native modules are written in WebAssembly using WASI. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, is that future, like clearly we need to have the um, like WASI implementation installed on my computer to run WASM files. Is that like, am I understanding that right? Actually, no. I mean, so node would have it baked in basically. Right. Um, and so Very when you good, install yeah. node, you'd have it already there for you. Cool. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Awesome. So, um, and, and so what that means is, um, if a language like Ruby were to compile to um, to a WASM file, and then that gets published to npm um, as a WASM file, um, then I could actually run it on my machine, um, even if I didn't have Ruby installed, because it's actually running within uh, WASM. Is that correct? It. Yes, it is quite, but it is a bit more complicated because a language like Ruby um, will... Maybe that was a bad so, example. I mean, but it's, so for a language like C, C++, Rust, um, the answer would be just absolutely unequivocally yes. Um, for languages mm. like Ruby, Python, or Go also, um, so Go targets WebAssembly. And in fact, a day after we announced WASI, someone had a work in progress, but working um, patch for Go to target not just WebAssembly, but WASI specifically, and use that as the system interface mm. for Go, which is really exciting. But mm -hmm. um, to make that work, they have to bundle the Go runtime because Go has a very mm. sophisticated garbage collection system and um, a runtime that is um, sophisticated, but also fairly large. And so a WebAssembly module, a WebAssembly slash WASI module written in one of these languages has to bundle that entire runtime or have that runtime available, perhaps as an external module at least. So for, the, mm. for a Ruby, um, application or script that would mean having the Ruby interpreter essentially bundled with it. And in fact, for Python, we have that. Another team at Mozilla has taken the Python interpreter 
and compiled it to WebAssembly. And that now runs on the client side for doing scientific computing tasks, which so far only worked in server-side installations. But they compiled the entirety of mm. the Python interpreter. And so it's not Python code compiled to WebAssembly. It's Python itself compiled to WebAssembly executing <laughs> Python code, unmodified Python code. And that's how mm. this work would work for oh. also for Ruby. I see. Okay, very interesting. So that that seems like potentially uh, problematic from the size standpoint. This is the same thing with. Uh, I remember when I was doing Java stuff, um, and I wanted to provide my users an executable that, that where they didn't have to have Java installed, like the runtime installed. I had to bundle the whole um, yeah. runtime into that .exe that yeah. I sent to them. But okay. The, uh, th yeah, that's one additional point on that. Yeah. Go what ahead. is um, interesting here is you're right. You, it, people have to have these different runtimes installed. If you get some Python code from someone, you have to have the Python interpreter installed and um, potentially even multiple different versions of it because there's this Python 2 versus mm. Python 3 um, conversion <laughs> that's been going on for a decade. And um, mm -hmm. uh, installing these can be a headache. And that is part of why this other um, Mozilla team took the Python interpreter, compiled it to WebAssembly. And um, with WASI, you can imagine a future where these kinds of interpreters are compiled to WebAssembly. And really, the only requirement you have is um, for, and, and so to a new operating system, if to compile or to, to run. Python code on a new operating system requires you to have it available on that system. One um, interesting thing there is there, you could imagine a future where the Python interpreter or the Ruby interpreter would be compiled to WebAssembly. And um, so porting them to a new operating system would be, well, you port the WASI runtime and you don't have to port all software to these uh, new uh, uh, operating systems. It would really just, you, you need the WASI runtime and then these other um, interpreters for other languages just work by being compiled to WASI. And then maybe later on you do a specific port because you want to have no overhead at all, but at least this would just work everywhere, wherever WASI is available. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Cool, so we're coming down on our time here. Um, so I, I want to encourage people to kind of get into uh, some of this stuff. So uh, what resources do you have for people who um, are interested in, in uh, learning um, about uh, WASM and WASI and um, yeah, trying to find places where they can actually um, implement this or play around with it. So for learning about WebAssembly, um, I have a series of code cartoons on the hacks.mozilla.org uh, blog. So I think that that gives a good intro to some of the concepts around WebAssembly. If you're looking to play around with WebAssembly, I really recommend the Rust to WebAssembly's uh, working groups They've done some documentation on how to compile Rust to WebAssembly that I think is really, really good. And this is actually, I think, uh, a lot of people are saying that the Rust uh, user experience for compiling to WebAssembly is the best language so far. So I think that uh, for people really just wanting to get started with it, that's a great starting place. Perfect. Um, and also, I am going to add a link to this as well. Um, the uh, blog post announcing the standardization of uh, WASI. Um, by you, Lynn, um, I thought was really informative, especially the little uh, demo video that you had there. So I'll add links to those as well. Great. And invite people to, to check those out. Thank you. I appreciate hearing that too. I'm glad it helped people understand these concepts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So um, is there um, any last uh, things that you want to share with the audience before we wrap this up? Maybe one thing is we are just starting out with WASI. And if this is something that is interesting to you, um, then we have wazi.dev that has more information, but we are also starting the standardization process for this. And in a, an online call tomorrow uh, for the 
W3C working group grant or community group grant WebAssembly, we will um, charter a subgroup. And um, if you think this is something where uh, contributing to this effort would be interesting to you, then I'd encourage you to join that, join us for the call, join the subgroup and get involved with that. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you both. Let's um, really quick. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, Lynn, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, so I am Lynn Clark, L-I-N-C-L-A-R-K on Twitter. Uh, and that's the best way to follow what I'm doing. Cool. Twitter is also the best way to follow me. And I'm T. Schneider White on Twitter. Can Maybe you can yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll get a link. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so yeah, that's that's our show this uh, this time around. So thanks uh, for uh, joining me for this. This is pretty interesting, especially the the WASI thing is really interesting. Um, I just love how the web is eating the world, even outside of the web. Um, and uh, I, I feel like WASI is a, a good step in the right direction, um, especially if I can avoid no JIP problems in the future. That'd just be <laughs> spectacular. Uh, so thanks, everybody, and we will catch you all next time. Goodbye.